So next speaker is Carlos Fernandez Granda from NYU, which is uh, we, going to be talk about uh, a sampling theorem for robust deconvolution. It does work. Okay. Um, all right. So today I'm going to be talking about the convolution. Uh, I have to acknowledge that this joint work with my PhD student Brett Bernstein at Courant and my former advisor Emmanuel Candes. Uh, this is funded by NSF. All right. So first I'm going to start by motivating uh, what I'm going to talk about with two practical applications. Then I'll talk a little bit about compressed sensing, not too much because I know that uh, you've been learning all about it uh, with Anders. Uh, then I will explain how to do the convolution in the frequency domain without taking into account sampling. Uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll explain our main result, which is a sampling theorem for the convolution. And if I have time, I'll talk about robustness to noise. If there's anything that isn't clear at any point, feel free to, to stop me. Okay, so one of our motivations is an application in seismology where you want to find out what layers there are underneath the Earth's surface. There's a technique for doing this called reflection seismology, where the idea is that you want to estimate the acoustic impedance of the different layers, which characterizes them to some extent, or equivalently, this thing called reflection coefficients that depend on the difference between the acoustic impedances at the interface between two layers. Okay, and if we manage to find this, then we, have, we, we will know what's underneath, if there's oil or water or whatever it is. Okay, so what do people do? What, what is reflection seismology? They basically send a sound wave down, usually using explosives or something like that, um, and then they record what comes back up. And uh, a, good, well, a reasonably good model for the data that you obtain like that is that it's basically the convolution of the poles that you send down with these reflection coefficients that you want to find, okay? So the data looks something like that. Of course, this is only a cartoon and I'm not an expert in reflection seismology. So, um, a model for the actual convolution kernel, okay, that arises from a process like this, which is often used for theoretical modeling in, in geophysics, is the Ricker wavelet, which looks like this and is basically the second derivative of a Gaussian. So that's what we're going to use in our analysis. We're going to assume that the convolution kernel is known, even though it might not in practice and you would also have to estimate it. Okay, so let's look at the mathematical model that we're going to analyze. We have some spikes, okay, that are supported continuously in some interval. We send the, this pulse down and what we get back is the convolution of the pulse with the spikes, uh, but we sample, okay? So we only get to see some points, okay? Maybe non-uniformly. Non uh, so our goal is going to be estimating those spikes from data like this. Okay, so if we look at the problem without, let's forget about sampling for a moment, and let's look at the problem in the, in the frequency domain. So what I've just explained is here, okay? We have these reflection coefficients that we want to estimate, they get convolved by this pulse, and that's the data, and then of course we sample. You look at this in the frequency domain, convolution is point-wise multiplication in frequency. If you look at the spectrum of, um, of the Ricker wavelet, it turns out that it's zero in a, beyond a certain cutoff frequency, and it's also zero here. So basically we're losing the frequency information in the signal in a really large band. And if you want to estimate a signal that is consistent with your data, you could actually fill this in almost arbitrarily to get infinite signals that would be consistent with your data. So the problem in general is obviously hopeless. However, as in comprehensive sensing, we can say, okay, but this thing, we know it's going to be sparse, or we want to assume that it's sparse. We think that there's not that many layers underneath. Okay, and as we will see later on, maybe we want to make even further assumptions. And the question is, under those assumptions, can we recover the original signal? Okay, another motivation is imaging, where uh, whenever you have an optical system and you're taking an image of something, the resolution that you're going to have in your optical system is limited fundamentally by diffraction. Uh, this happens, for example, in fluorescence microscopy, where they take 
a lot of pictures of uh, some fluorescent probes within a cell, uh, which are supposed to be just points, shining points, uh, but they're not. Because of the microscope, you're going to see actually blurry points. And if you put all those images together to try to image the cell without performing some kind of processing, you're going to see something like this. So basically nothing. Um, however, if you manage to deconvolve each of these points and then put them together, you get to see very fine structure in the cell. Okay? Um, uh, the people that came up with fluorescence microscopy were awarded the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry a few years ago. Okay, so now let's look at a simplified mathematical model that we're going to analyze. Uh, now we're going to model the convolution kernel as a Gaussian. Um, and the point sources are like this. Of course, in imaging they would all be positive, but we're going to just consider arbitrary amplitudes. Uh, these point sources, that are maybe the fluorescent probes, you can think of them like that, they get convolved with the convolution kernel, and then we, we get to see samples. Okay, and the problem, again, is really similar. You have these samples, and we want to recover the original spikes in a tractable way. Again, if we look at this in the frequency domain, we're losing essentially the high frequencies of, of the signal. Okay, so all these high frequencies uh, are suppressed by the fact that the, by the convolution because the, frequen the spectrum of the kernel is zero there. Uh, and the problem is hopelessly posed, but the question is, can we do something if we have this reflection coefficient, uh, sorry, if we, have, if we make assumptions, like sparsity assumptions, on these reflection coefficients. Okay, so the, how, how can we actually find a tractable algorithm that imposes that? So, I mean, as you probably uh, heard Anders talk about quite a bit, uh, a good idea is to minimize the L1 norm. So it turns out that the first people to do this, uh, to propose this, as far as I know, for, for this kind of problems, uh, were geophysicists that were working on reflection seismology in the 70s and 80s. Okay, there's quite a few papers about this. Uh, and what they saw is that it works. So basically they suggested minimizing the L1 norm of the estimate subject to data constraints, okay? And if you do it for the two examples that I just showed you, it basically works. However, at that point, we, like, they didn't have a theoretical understanding of when this is guaranteed to work or, or why it does. And that's the point of this talk. Uh, in order to explain that, we're, first, we're going to draw uh, from intuitions and tools uh, in compressed sensing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about compressed sensing, even though I know that you know all about it by now. So as you know, a uh, big motivation for compressed sensing is MRI. Here I'm showing a slice of the brain, the 2D Fourier, uh, Fourier space or K space. And this is just the logarithm so that you actually see something because almost all of the energy is in the low frequencies. Okay, so as I assume you have heard, a lot of images in MRI are highly compressible. And a big issue, so here are the wavelet coefficients of this brain image, and a lot of them are zero. A big issue in, in MRI is uh, trying to minimize the time that it takes to, to measure, to, to obtain an MRI from a person. Um, so we would like to take less samples from the spectrum. Uh, and the intuition behind compressed sensing is if the images are compressible, why don't we acquire them compressively directly? Um, and the idea is to undersample randomly, or if we want to be uh, more, um, I mean, usually you cannot do complete random undersampling in MRI, as you might have heard. Uh, you, but basically we sample at least pseudo randomly, and then we solve an optimization problem, which is minimizing the L1 norm of the signal in whatever domain we know it's sparse, subject to the data constraints. So here we, we saw that the brain image is sparse in the wavelet domain. You would minimize the L1 norm in that domain. And for this example, you get a pretty decent result for a ratio of two undersampling. Okay? And in applications like angiography, where you're looking at veins, the undersampling ratios can be, be, mu can be much much larger, and also if you're in 3D or, or you're looking at videos. Okay, so now um, we're going to look at a simplified theoretical model of, um, of compressed sensing, where we have a sparse signal, and instead of uh, having its whole spectrum, we just have some random samples from the spectrum, okay? We're in 1D. And what we want to do is recover the signal for th from these random samples. 
okay, so we minimize the L1 norm subject to data constraints and it works. And now we're, we, we could ask two questions. First of all, um, is the problem well posed even if we add sparsity assumptions? Or in other words, could there be two sparse signals that give us the same data? Okay, because we're recovering a sparse signal, but it would be good to know if there, were, if there could be another sparse signal that would also be consistent with the data that we're acquiring. Because in that, sense, in that, in that case, the problem doesn't really make sense. And second of all, when can we guarantee that L1 norm minimization is actually going to work? Okay, so to answer the first question, let's look at the measurement model again. Uh, so here is the signal which we're going to model as a vector. If we had all of the spectrum, then uh, basically, so this is the DFT matrix. So we apply the DFT matrix to the vector, we, ha we get the whole spectrum, and we would of course be able to invert and obtain the original signal. However, in compressed sensing, what we do is we just take some random rows from this DFT matrix, okay? So this, this uh, small number of measurements are going to be inner products between these random sinusoids and the signal. Okay, so now we have a, an underdetermined linear problem which has obviously infinite solutions and it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about whether it's well conditioned or not because it's underdetermined. However, we can consider what happens uh, when this linear operator acts upon sparse vectors. When it acts upon sparse vectors, what matters is the submatrix of the columns corresponding to the sparse, sub to the sparse vector, okay? So to the, the non-zero entries of the vector. So if that submatrix is ill-conditioned, we can forget about recovering, um, recovering sparse vectors because that means that even if we know the location of the sparse vector and we just invert the corresponding submatrix, that's ill-conditioned. Okay, so we can forget about recovering the original signal, especially given that we don't know the support of the sparse signal. Uh, and we would have to require that every sparse submatrix in this measurement matrix is well conditioned. Well, that's exactly the restricted isometry property that says that um, a matrix essentially conserves the energy of any S sparse vector, okay? More, put more formally, it conserves the L2 norm like this. Um, so Candesantau in 2006 uh, showed that, the, RI, uh, that um, the random Fourier matrix that we've been talking about satisfies the restricted isometry property with high probability. Uh, so that the problem is well posed. And just to make clear why that means that at least in principle, the problem of recovering sparse vectors is well posed if we have the RIP, imagine that a matrix has the 2S RIP, and that we have two different S sparse signals. S is a number, okay, like the, the sparsity level, the number of non-zeros. We have two S sparse signals, X1 and X2, and we're worried that when we apply, like when we actually see the measurements, they might be the same. Well, if we have the RIP, the two S RIP, um, the difference between the data is the same as applying the linear operator to the difference between the two signals. And the difference between the two signals cannot have more than two S non-zeros because each of them has uh, S non-zeros. And now we can just apply the restricted isometry property to show that we have a lower bound on the difference between the data corresponding to the two signals. So if the two signals are different, we're going to have different data and in principle at least we could try to recover them. But I haven't said how to do, well, I have, but we haven't talked about how to do it yet. Um, so now we're going to see how to analyze L1 norm minimization for, for compressed sensing. Okay, you've probably seen this already. Um, it's just really quick geometric intuition. You're probably tired of seeing the picture, but I'm going to describe it quickly anyways. We have a hyperplane uh, of possible feasible points that satisfy this linear constraint. And what we're doing is we're making the L1 norm small, small, small until there's just one point that touches the L1 norm ball. And that means that that point is going to be the one uh, with minimum L1 norm uh, subject to the data constraints. So here in 2D, the intuition is that because this thing is pointy, you're going to be closer to signals that are one sparse for a lot of these hyperplanes. So maybe if you have one that is random, you're going to be fine. 
Whereas if you minimize the L2 nor norm ball because it's a circle, this won't happen anymore. This is just intuition. It doesn't prove anything, but it kind of gives us an idea of why this is working out. But now let's take a look at how to prove these things a bit more formally. So we want to show that our original sparse signal X is the solution to the problem minimizing minimize the L1 norm subject to the data constraints, okay? And one way of proving that this actually is the case, that this is the unique solution, is by building a dual certificate. Here the word dual refers to the fact that what we're going to build is, is uh, feasible for the dual problem of this guy. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk, okay? So you can ignore that. Okay, so what's a dual certificate? A dual certificate is a vector V such that if we apply the transpose of A, we get something um, which we call Q, which is a subgradient of the L1 norm at the original signal. Uh, does every, who doesn't know what a subgradient is? Okay, so very quickly, if you have a convex function, okay, this has, like at any point, it has a gradient that defines a supporting hyperplane, okay? So as, as an intuition of what we're going to do now, if you have a strictly convex function that you can show at some point that the gradient is zero, that means that the hyperplane is horizontal and this is the unique solution to this uh, optimization problem, okay? If you were minimizing a function like that. The L1 norm is not like that because at some points, as we saw, it's pointy. Okay, but it still has subgradients, which are supporting planes, okay, at the points where it's non-differentiable. It turns out that at a point like that, a subgradient of the L1 norm is going to satisfy that it's equal to the sign um, of the entries that are non-zero in those entries, and it's going to be smaller than one uh, where the signal is zero, okay? So if, there, if we find a vector that satisfies this, then it's a subgradient of the L1 norm at this other vector. And it defines a, a supporting plane, a, a, a plane underneath, a hyperplane underneath the, the function, the L1 norm function. Um, more formally, a subgradient of the L1 norm at a certain point satisfies this. The function at another point, x plus u, is going to be greater or equal to the function, which in this case is the L1 norm at x, plus the inner product between the subgradient and u. So you can see that this is defining this hyperplane that I'm talking about. The certificate is not only a subgradient. It's a, it's a subgradient that is made using the rows of A. Okay, it's A transpose V, so basically we're taking a linear combination of the rows of A to build this subgradient. And remember that the rows of A are these random sinusoids, okay? All right, so now I claim that if we have a subgradient that is built using these random sinusoids, this shows that X is the, um, is, the, is the unique solution to the optimization problem. Okay, so why is that the case? Well, if we look at any other feasible point that also satisfies the linear constraints, we can write it as X plus H where AH is equal to zero, okay? Is that clear to everyone? Because we know that AX is equal to Y. So then we can see what the L1 norm there is at X plus H, and by, because Q is a subgradient, it's going to be the L1 norm of X plus the inner product between Q and H. But now we have this constraint that Q is actually equal to A transpose V. So this inner product is actually the inner product between V and AH, but AH is zero by assumption. So here we're showing that the L1 norm is, great, is greater or equal to the uh, L1 norm at the original signal, so the original signal um, is actually a solution. I haven't shown that it's a unique solution. The argument is very similar. I'm not going to show it here, okay? But it's really very similar. So the point is that if we want to show that a certain signal is going to be recovered by L1 norm minimization, we just need to build a certificate. If we want to show that any sparse signal um, is recovered by L1 norm minimization, then we have to give some kind of procedure to automatically build a certificate from the sparse signal and show that it is going to work for a certain sparsity level, okay, for a certain number of non-zeros. If we do that, then we have shown that L1 norm minimization actually recovers sparse signals. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so we, imagine that you have an arbitrary support like that. 
Now uh, you take the sign of the sparse signal at its non-zero locations, and what you need to do is to linearly combine these random sinusoids to interpolate the sign and make sure that the magnitude doesn't go beyond one, so it's a valid subgradient. A way to do this in this case is saying, okay, I have, if the sparsity is not uh, too high, I have some degrees of freedom, so I'm going to take the, com the linear combination of these random sinusoids that does that, that interpolates, and has minimum L2 norm. That actually has a closed form solution that you can analyze and you can show that actually this works out. And that's what Candes Romberg et al. did in 2006 to show that compressed sensing from random frequency measurements works out for a level of measurements that is linear in the sparsity up to log factors. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay. So now we're going to go back to the problem that I'm interested in, which is the deconvolution problem. Um, but first, actually, we're going to look at a simplified version where we don't get to worry about the samples. So if the, we're going to assume, actually, that the convolution kernel is exactly low pass, which is not the case for the Ricker wavelet, for example, because it has this zero at the origin, and it's not strictly the case for the Gaussian. But for this section, we're going to assume that it's exactly low pass. Uh, if it's exactly low pass and we take um, and we sample the data at the Nyquist rate, essentially it's, this is equivalent to having the whole low pass spectrum of this signal. Okay? So just imagine that now we're replacing this by a sync kernel. If we do that, we can assume that we have the low pass Fourier coefficients up to a certain point. Okay? So now uh, let me explain the model of the, that I'm going to work with. Now we don't have a vector anymore as we had in compressed sensing. I'm going to consider that the signal are just spikes in the unit interval. And those spikes can be anywhere on the unit interval. And I'm assuming actually complex amplitudes because this, is, this problem is also useful for spectral super resolution in signal processing. Um, OK, and now I'm going to assume that I have access to the low pass Fourier coefficients of this signal up to a certain cutoff frequency FC. OK, and I'm, that's an, a linear operator. Um, it's acting on a measure instead on, of on a vector, but you can just think of it, I mean, just a linear operator, uh, which takes inner products with low pass sinusoids. We're going to see a picture in a moment. And that linear operator, I'm going to call it FC. Any questions about the model? Okay, so just to make clear the difference with compressed sensing, in compressed sensing we had samples from all over the spectrum and we wanted to fill in the missing ones to complete the, the signal. Here we have samples only from the low pass part of the spectrum and we want to extrapolate the high frequency ones, which uh, we can already see seems like a more difficult problem. Okay, so because I'm using, uh, we're working with measures and not um, with uh, the L1 norm, we have to use the total variation norm, which is just a, counter, a continuous counterpart of the L1 norm. It has this definition, but don't worry about it. It's like a continuous analog of the L1 norm. And in fact, if you take the total variation norm of a superposition of Dirac measures, the, that total variation norm is just the L1 norm of the coefficients. Okay, that's all it is. Uh, it's not the total variation that you use uh, in signal processing or in image processing. Um, it's, it's not, okay? So, so it's a continuous analog of the L1 norm. Okay, so now let's take a look at the two questions that we uh, talked about for compressed sensing. First, is this problem well posed? Can there be two sparse signals that give me the same data? Second of all, does total variation norm minimization actually work? Or can we guarantee that it works, rather? Okay, so um, again, the same picture. Now, the only difference is that here we don't have a vector, okay? We, this, you can think of it as the unit interval, and I can have non-zeros anywhere on this line. And these are uh, the sinusoids. We take inner products with sinusoids to obtain the spectrum of X, which is infinite, but bear with me. So now in, um, for this problem, we're assuming that we only have access to the low pass part of the spectrum up to a certain cutoff frequency FC. Okay, so we have a finite number of Fourier coefficients that go from minus FC to FC, basically, which are the inner product of this measure with these slowly varying sinusoids. So now we can ask, do we have the restricted isometry property? Okay. 
So remember that here we can put spikes wherever we want. In particular, we can put two spikes that are super close to each other, very, very close. And remember that here we have very slowly varying sinusoids. So if the two spikes are too close, the corresponding columns of this infinite matrix are going to be essentially the same. Okay, so if we put a one here and a, a minus one here, they could be completely canceled out in the data. Okay, to be strict, like almost canceled out. So uh, that sum matrix is extremely ill-conditioned. We don't have the restricted isometry property at all. Okay, not even close. Uh, however, if you consider sub matrices corresponding to signals uh, whose non-zeros are a bit further apart, where the support is not very clustered, then these sub matrices actually are well conditioned. So maybe we need additional conditions before, uh, beyond sparsity to derive guarantees for this problem. And that's what we do. Okay, we introduce a minimum separation condition, which is just the minimum distance between any two non-zeros in the signal. And we call that delta. Okay, so it turns out that if the minimum separation is below one over the cutoff frequency, the problem is ill posed. There's going to be two sparse signals that give you almost the same data. I'm going to show an example in a moment. If you're above one over the cutoff frequency, you're fine. Okay, like this cannot happen anymore. Uh, this is not proved by us. Uh, it can be proved using um, Slepian's uh, discrete prolet spheroidal functions from the 60s. Uh, and le um, recently, Ankur Moitra from MIT has provided a non-asymptotic proof. Just to give you an idea of uh, what this means, this one over the cutoff frequency, I told you that now we're assuming that we just convolve with a sink. Well, it's the width of the sink, okay? From here to here. That's one over the cutoff frequency. If the minimum separation of the signal is below that, then we run into problems in terms of um, how well posed the problem is. Just to show you an example where this, we have two signals that where the minimum separation is slightly smaller than one over the cutoff frequency, we convolve them with this sink, and this is the data that we get. Okay? If we put them on top of each other, you will see that the signals are very different, completely different, in fact, but the data are almost exactly the same. Almost, eh? they're not identically the same, but if we have a little bit of noise, good luck trying to disentangle these two signals. Why does this happen? This happens because there can be sparse signals that are almost in the null space of this measurement operator. So the difference between the two signals, because their minimum separation is not big enough, uh, is almost high pass, okay? Like all of, its, uh, all of its energy is in the high pass part of the spectrum. What we're measuring, this is the spectrum of the difference. What we're measuring is this part. We're taking uh, Fourier coefficients up to a frequency of 1,000, okay? So again, it's going to be impossible to tell these two signals apart, even if there's just a little bit of noise. However, above one of the cutoff kind of frequency, we're fine. Okay, so now let's turn uh, to the problem of seeing when can we recover the signals in a tractable way uh, using convex optimization. Okay, so now instead of minimizing the L1 norm, we're going to minimize the total variation norm over all measures supported on the unit interval, but the problem is very similar, okay? I'm not going to talk about that today, but this can actually be uh, implemented uh, in the continuous domain directly by recasting the dual as a semi-definite program. And the, but that only works in the 1D case. If you're in 2D uh, or you don't have an exact sync, you, you might have to discretize and actually solve an L1 norm problem. But in order to not worry about those details, we're going to consider that we're minimizing the total variation norm directly. Okay, so it turns out that because it's almost basically like the L1 norm, the subgradients, or what you could call, in some sense, the subgradients, if we're not being very formal, of the L1 norm, look very similar. So a certificate for the total variation norm at the original signal looks like this. It again interpolates the sign pattern of the signal wherever it's non-zero, okay? And again, its magnitude is smaller than one uh, when the signal is zero. It's all, and now it's also a linear combination of the columns of this measurement operator, okay? Like it's given by the adjoint of the measurement operator applied to a certain vector. 
The big difference now is that uh, the rows of this measurement vector, remember, now I have to, yeah, okay, they're low pass sinusoids. They're not random sinusoids anymore, okay? And that's pretty important. It's important because when you look at the problem of building this certificate for an arbitrary sparse signal, you could have a situation where the sparse signal is very clustered together, like the support of the sparse signal is super clustered together and the signs change, then it's going to be impossible to make a slowly varying uh, trigonometric polynomial pass through them and be bounded by one. Okay, you could still do that, but it's going to just shoot out. However, we're not interested in just sparse signals anymore. We're interested in sparse signals that have a certain minimum separation. Okay, so for that class of signals for which the problem is well posed, maybe we can come up with something. So now our task is to interpolate the sign pattern of these well-separated signals uh, with a, with a low-pass trigonometric polynomial. Um, one of the first ideas that you might have is just taking uh, a sink. I mean, you can't do a sink because it doesn't decay quick enough, but something like that, like a Fedger kernel, and just interpolate. And this almost works out, okay? So if you use some kind of low-pass kernel, okay, that is where the spectrum is just supported between minus FC and FC, and it's as pointy as you can. It's not going to be super pointy because we have the cutoff frequency, but still, and you interpolate this almost works out. It's a very technical detail, but I'll tell you anyways. It doesn't completely work out because um, this uh, polynomial is a bit annoying and tends to go up beyond one close to the spike. Uh, but however, you can push it down by adding some degrees of freedom to the construction and using the derivative of this kernel that is going to be low pass. But the point is that you can build, you can use some low pass kernel to interpolate the sign pattern and show uh, that for signals with a minimum separation, you can build the certificate and hence the total variation norm minimization is going to work out. Okay, and that's what we did um, for signals with a minimum separation of two over the cutoff frequency with my advisor, Emmanuel Candes. And we also have a similar result in 2D where we consider um, point-wise sources in two dimensions. Again, just if you're convolving with a sync function. Um, we know that this is not completely tight because the problem is well posed when you're above one over the cutoff frequency. In another paper, I sharpened it to 1.26, okay? In, sim in numerical simulations, so here I'm showing heat maps where black means that the problem does not recover the true solution for, um, for a few signals, and white that it does work. Um, on the x-axis, we have the minimum separation. On the y-axis, we have the number of spikes for different cutoff frequencies. And what we see is that this seems to work out as soon as we're going up to one over the cutoff frequency. So we conjecture that that's the right separation, uh, separation but we've only managed to, to prove down to 1.26. Okay, so that was the story about how to do the convolution when your convolution kernel is exactly low pass. Okay, and you sample uniformly at the Nyquist rate. Now we're going to take a look at what happens if we only have the samples. Okay, what can we say about what sampling patterns we need in order to, to deconvolve the signal directly from the sample data? The, the, the model that I'm going to talk about is quite similar. We have Dirac measures in a certain interval. Now I'm considering um, real amplitudes. And uh, we get to see the convolution with either a Gaussian kernel, which is motivated by imaging, or a Ricker wavelet that is motivated by reflection seismology. Um, we see the convolution sampled at certain points, okay, which we call S1, S2, and so on. Um, this operator is clearly linear. I'm going to call it uh, wiggly k. Okay? So again, we have a linear measurement operator and a signal that are, is basically Dirac measures on an interval. Okay, so again, we're going to ask the same two questions. When is this well posed? And does total variation norm minimization actually work? Um, because we're sampling, but we still have an almost low pass kernel convolved with the signal, we're going to need the minimum separation by the same argument that I told you before. I mean, you could look at the matrix. It's going to be uh, very badly conditioned if you take some matrices that are clustered. 
And you can also think of it in, in the sense that taking samples is only going to make your life more difficult. So anyways, we, we need um, a minimum separation condition because the um, kernels are approximately low pass. So let's talk about the sampling pattern. We want to characterize arbitrary, possibly non-uniform sampling patterns. So something that you can't, um, you can't beat is basically, well, something that you absolutely need is at least two samples per spike. And that's easy to see because you want to know, you want to find out where the spike is and its amplitude, which are two independent parameters, okay? So you better have two data to estimate those independent parameters, otherwise, Okay, so we're going to need at least two samples, and the kernels that we're considering decay rather fast, because it's a Gaussian and the second derivative of a Gaussian. So those two samples shouldn't be too far from the original spike, otherwise they're going to contain negligible energy uh, for that particular spike, and you're not going to be able to find the location and the amplitude if you don't have at least two samples that are close enough. Okay. So because of that, we um, define the sample proximity of a sample set and a support set, and we say that they satisfy the sample proximity, or they have a sample proximity of gamma if for every spike in the support, we have two samples that are gamma close, okay? I'm going to show a picture in a moment. This allows us to characterize arbitrary non-uniform sampling pattern. So there can be samples all over the place, but we require, and this is in some sense a necessary condition, well, okay, it will depend on gamma, but you will need this for some gamma. Uh, you will need to have at least two samples that are close to each spike, okay? But you could have more samples that are close uh, and other stuff can be going on uh, elsewhere, okay? So we're interested in trying to prove um, when uh, convex programming works when total variation or minimization gives us the original, um, the original signal under this minimum separation and this sample proximity conditions. And, um, and the problem that we assume that we, that, that, that we are solving is minimizing the total variation norm subject to these data constraints. And here, it's an interesting research problem to think about how to solve this on the, in the continuous domain. Right now, we're just discretizing and solving the L1 norm minimization problem. But anyways, we assume that we were able to, to solve it in an arbitrarily fine grid. Okay, so I guess not surprisingly at this point of the talk, we're going to try to see if we can build a dual certificate for, the total, for this minimization problem. So just in the case where we were looking at the convolution with the sink at this low pass measurement operator, here, the dual certificate looks very much like the certificate that we discussed for compressed sensing. Um, basically, it interpolates the sign pattern of uh, these spikes on, their, on the spike locations, and it has to be bounded by one elsewhere. Okay, so same thing. What changes, again, is the, um, the row space of this linear operator. The row space of this linear operator, if you look at it, is actually composed of the convolution kernel fixed at the sample points. So now we cannot you know, move kernels around to interpolate, they have to be fixed at the points where we take the samples. So what we want to show is that for a certain minimum separation and a certain sampling proximity that tells us that we're going to have two samples that are close to each spike, we can interpolate this thing using only convolution kernels that are centered at the samples. So very quickly we see that if we had one spike which didn't have any samples nearby, we're going to have a tough time because we're going to have to use fixed kernels that are far and I don't know how uh, linearly combine them so that it actually, they actually interpolate one here and they don't go beyond one, okay? In fact, that will probably be impossible after a certain separation. Okay, but we are assuming that we have both a minimum separation and a, a sam sample proximity. So we have at least two samples that are close to each spike, okay? So maybe we can do something with this. And what we can do is we can say, okay, I'm only going to use those two samples because anyways, that's what we are assuming that the, those two samples are there. We're not assuming anything else. Um, and now, if I want to guarantee that I interpolate 
the sign pattern. And I also actually want to guarantee that w uh, when I interpolate, I have zero derivative there so that they don't, this doesn't go beyond one or minus one as I showed for the previous construction. If I want to guarantee that, this gives me two, um, two S equations, S is about, like it gives me twice the number of equations than the number of spikes, okay? And since I have two samples per spike, I can just actually um, find these coefficients so that this, um, this holds exactly, okay, by solving a linear system. So that gives me a procedure for building a certificate. And it looks like this. So I have these two spikes for this, uh, sorry, these two samples for this spike, these two samples for this spike, and these two samples for this spike. I have to interpolate one minus one and one. I want to make the derivative zero here, here, and here. And I have six coefficients to play with. So I can just solve a linear system so that they, uh, so that they actually interpolate and have zero derivative there. And the, the, the system is actually going to be invertible as long as we have a certain minimum separation. What's the problem? The problem is that if I do this, and now I go back and I want to analyze this thing to say, oh, it will work for an arbitrary signal with a certain minimum separation and a certain sample proximity, then my life becomes quite hard because these coefficients actually vary a lot depending on where the samples are with respect to the spike. If this one is very close, it's going to be almost up like close to one and the other one is going to be super small. They're very difficult to characterize in general. Okay, and look at the one for the Ricker wavelet. Okay, like it even looks more weird. Again, you have these kernels fixed at the samples and we are reweighting them so that they build a certificate. But it's really tough to analyze. So to make our life easier, what we do is basically a change of variable. We reparameterize this construction in terms of what we call bumps and waves, which is just a change of variable where we take the, the two kernels that are close to each spike and we kind of reweigh them to create two different functions, a bump and a wave. So I want to show you a picture now. So and then, and then we will actually reparameterize the construction in terms of those bumps and waves. But the actual certificate is going to stay the same. This is just for analysis purposes. So we take these two kernels that are close to a given spike and we add them up so that they, so that they build a bump that is equal to one on, that, um, on the spike and has zero derivative, okay? So now we have a kind of kernel that is actually centered right at the spike, which is nice. Of course, we need extra degrees of freedom if we just build a bump at each spike, we're not going to be able to constrain the derivative to be zero at those points. We need an extra degree of freedom, and what we do is basically we build some pseudo derivative or something like that of the bump by just con uh, taking a linear combination that is zero at the spike, okay, and uh, that has a derivative equal to one there. Okay, so what happens now? Now I'm going to use these two things to interpolate the sign pattern, and this is exactly equivalent to using the original kernels, but hopefully the coefficients are going to be better behaved. So if I do this for the Ricker wavelet, this is what the bump looks, and this is what the wave looks like, okay? So kind of similar. And you could apply this to your favorite convolution kernel, okay? This doesn't depend on the kernel being a Gaussian or a Ricker wavelet, although it kind of does depend on the kernel being kind of spiky and then decaying. Anyway, so again, what we do is we can fit these coefficients to do what we want, but then we don't know what to do with them because they, you know, they vary a lot depending on where the spikes are and the samples are, it's really annoying. So what we do is we do a change of variable to these bumps and waves, which are just linear combinations of the kernels, so it's actually completely equivalent. What happens if you do that is that the coefficient on each bump is roughly the sign pattern of that particular spike, and the wave coefficients are super small. Okay, and that allows us to prove our result much more easily. So basically from this, we go to this. Okay, where now we have these bumps. This bump is almost one, its, it's amplitude is almost one. This bump's amplitude is almost minus one. This bump's amplitude is almost one, and the waves are super small, okay? And the same for the Ricker. We have this mess, and boom. Now we have a bump that is almost one, bump that is almost minus one, bump that is almost one. And then we can actually analyze this 
to prove that we get exact recovery for certain minimum separations and certain sample proximities. And uh, this is what we did, and that's our result. Uh, from a minimum separation of three times the um, standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel, we get exact recovery, which is this orange region, uh, for sample proximities that, you know, like grow uh, from this point, okay? In order to try to see how well we are doing in terms of bounding what we have to bound and characterizing when this works out, we did some numerical simulations with a very weird sampling pattern that only has these two, that only has two samples per spike that are at a certain sample proximity for these spike separations. I'm saying that it's a weird sampling pattern because in practice, to have that sampling pattern, you would have to know where the spikes are, which defeats the purpose of this, of this whole endeavor but it's, it's good for validating our, our results. So in that case, we get this. Here we have a weird thing where if the spike separation is very small, there's a bit of crosstalk between the samples, but you can ignore it. Essentially, the real result is something like this, okay? What we would wish to get. And as you can see, we're not that far off in characterizing when the optimization method actually works. We can do this also for, uh, okay, and in order to further validate what's going on, we also did some simulations on, um, on a uniform grid. On a uniform grid, you could argue that the sample proximity is half the grid width because you could have a spike right in the middle of two samples, maybe. Um, so, so basically, actually, this kind of corresponds because we, we have like a, sample like a grid width of two here whereas here we go up to a sample separation of one. Okay, the spike separation that we prove is kind of around here. Okay, so we do the same for the Ricker kernel. Again, this shows when we prove um, exact recovery. This is what happens when we do this specialized numerical simulation to validate the results, and they're quite similar once you ignore this part. And this is the, the, something very similar happens for the uniform grid, where here we have double the, the values that we get there. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk very briefly in five minutes about robustness to noise, because up to now I've just been talking about exact recovery. I'm not going to go into any proofs, I'm just going to tell you about the two models that we have and roughly the kind of results that we prove. The results are mostly based on the um, dual certificate construction that I just described, and they use techniques based on, uh, on previous work in the case of the sync kernel, okay, the convolution of the sync kernel, so they're not super interesting. So if we have additive noise with bounded norm, we can, which looks kind of like this, okay, so we have the convolution and then there's some noise on top. Um, that was for the Gaussian kernel, this is for the Ricker wavelet. We solve a relaxed problem where we don't have equality constraints anymore. Okay, we have this L2 relaxed constraint. Um, it kind of works out. You, you just try it numerically, but you have you know some small spikes sometimes that appear, or like yeah, like maybe two spikes instead of one close to the location if the spike is very small. Um, so we have a result that characterizes the error in the support detection. Essentially, like this is a bit difficult to parse, I'm going to just describe it, and if you're interested, you can look at the paper. We're saying that close to the original spike, okay, at, uh, in a region of 0 0.15 times the um, standard deviation, if you have the same sample separation and minimum separation conditions, you can show that most of the spikes are going to be in regions like that, okay, in, around each of the spikes, and that elsewhere, the, um, the spikes that appear are going to be quite small, okay? But this is a small, no like um, a proof that is non-asymptotic, but for very small noise, and it definitely doesn't tell the whole story. But at least it, it, it shows, it's indicative that the problem is robust to, to additive noise. Okay, um, we also have um, another noise model, and this is mostly just to show that with this optimization problems, you can deal with structure relatively easily. So for example, if you have a problem where you have impulsive noise, so now this thing here is, does not just have um, bounded norm, it's a sparse 
uh, it's a sparse vector because maybe you have outliers in your data, so it can shoot up and down arbitrarily at some points. Yeah, if you have data like that, okay, where you have these outliers, you can deal with them quite easily by adding an additional variable to the optimization problem to model the sparse noise, okay, this W variable, and you can um, penalize its L1 norm to make sure that, you're, that it's going to be sparse. Okay, so it works out in practice. If, there's, if, there's not, if there are not too many corruptions, it works out exactly, which is kind of interesting as opposed to the, in the dense noise case. And because it works exactly, one would think, oh, maybe I can build a certificate to, to guarantee that this actually works out, which people have done earlier for things like robust PCA uh, and also problems of this form in compressed sensing. And actually you can, using a con um, construction that is based on the one that I presented for the exact recovery. We haven't pushed this through very much because we wanted to be done with the paper. Uh, but basically we show that for a certain value of the uh, regularization parameter, this is going to work out if the samples are on a grid, you have a minimum separation for the spikes, you have a minimum separation for the samples, and you have two clean samples near each spike and two clean samples near um, each, each sample, okay, each noisy sample. So the conditions are quite arbitrary. I mean, they show that this kind of works out, but it would be interesting to characterize this under more general conditions. Okay, so just to conclude, um, as I told you at the beginning, um, doing L1 norm minimization for deconvolving spikes is a very old idea from the 70s at the eight, and the 80s. At that point, we didn't have the theoretical tools to understand why it works, but now we do thanks to compressed sensing. However, we cannot just apply compressed sensing theory blindly to the problem because um, it's not going to work out, as I showed you, but we can use the intuition and adapt it to establish some conditions beyond sparsity um, that make the problem well posed in some sense. And I've shown you that under those conditions, you can actually show that the method, you can actually show that the method achieves exact recovery and is robust to both dense and sparse noise. Okay, so before finishing, I wanted to show you some related work of actually some people that are around here. So Johan's work that started total variation norm minimization for these kinds of problems. Um, Gabriel's work on um, the recovery of sparse spikes from low pass data and some other stuff. Uh, these are some references on reflection seismology. These are some references on compressed sensing. There's of course thousands more. These are references about the low pass, the recovery of spikes from low pass data. Um, and this is the paper that will come out uh, in a couple, hopefully in a week or so. And that's it. Any questions? Uh, I have a question about the sampling procedure you presented. So. You mentioned that we need uh, at least two samples around each spike. So, but at first time we need to find the location of these spikes. So, how, how do you that's, do that? That's an excellent question. So, just to be clear, we're using those two samples that are close to the spike. They don't have to be around; they could be on, on either side to prove that the method works. We are proving that it works for any sampling pattern that includes those samples, but you don't have to know where they are. Okay, that's uh, it's an excellent question because of that. Like that, um, so the question is more whether the results are accurate in terms of the sample proximity that you need. And that's maybe that's that could be the problem. But I just want to make clear that we are proving that this works out for any non-uniform sampling pattern as long as those two samples are there, and we don't need to know where they are. Okay, that so that ties well with the point of why this, like the numerical simulations that we do, don't make a lot of sense from the practical point of view, because we wouldn't know where the spikes are. Um, yeah, so I was wondering for the uh, noise modeling, uh, at a certain point you said that you model this uh, uh, having a sparse structure. Uh, 
what does this structure correspond in reality? Well, no. So we have two results for noise, as I mentioned. The first one doesn't assume anything except it's bounded L2 norm, okay? And that's the more realistic one. You have additive Gaussian noise, for example, something like that. The second result, as I said, is just to show you that if you happen to be in an application where you have outliers, okay, like, I don't know, some sensor can break down at some point and, and a um, sample is completely off, but you don't have a lot of those, it's a good idea to add an L1 norm penalty in the data domain, actually, to deal with outliers in the data domain. And you can actually analyze that with a certificate. Okay. And uh, my second question, uh, uh, the sigma you also estimated? Uh, so that's an excellent question. Here we're assuming that we know the convolution kernel, which of course in practice is often not going to be the case. That problem is called blind deconvolution, and there's a lot of recent interesting work when the kernel is actually random, it would be very interesting to have results that deal with the case where you have deterministic kernels of this form. In practice, what people do is they alternate between estimating the kernel and estimating the spikes, okay? But there's not much theoretical characterization about that, so that's a very good question. Could you comment on the artifacts you had on the diagram, like the fish transition diagrams? They were numerical um, or? So the art of, you mean the, um, the numerical simulations? Yeah. So again, these numerical simulations are for this weird sampling pattern, okay, where we are where we just have two spikes. So we have two samples close to the spikes, which is, I mean, you would have to know where the spikes are to actually come up with that sampling pattern, so it's not realistic, but we want to see how sharp we are in our theoretical analysis, okay? So here what we conjecture that is happening is the spike separation is so small and the sample proximity is relatively big so that uh, you have that the sample from the spike to the left can help you to estimate the spike to the right. Something like that. But again, this is not the numerical performance of the method. This is just to see how sharp we are in our analysis when we consider any possible non-uniform sampling pattern that has that sample proximity, okay? But thank you, I mean, this is important to clarify. Uh, sorry, I didn't get for the sparse corruption problem, how many measurements do you, do you need in terms of the number of spikes and the number of corruptions? So again, again, this is not, uh, not at all the end of the story uh, for this model. What we prove, which the conditions are rather arbitrary, oops, is that we have uh, a fixed lambda, we put the samples on a grid that has a certain width that varies from that to that for the Gaussian and from that to that to the Ricker. Uh, the signal has a minimum separation of at least that for the Gaussian and at least that for the Ricker, mm -hmm. okay? And then we have these noisy samples, okay? We ask that there be two clean samples to the right and to the left of the noisy samples and two clean samples surrounding any spike, every spike. Why does this make our life easier? Because if you have several noisy samples in a row, life becomes more difficult because this could start, look, look, could start looking like a kernel that is actually there, okay? So you can start mimicking uh, a spurious spike there if you have several samples in a row. So that makes our life easier. And in practice also, uh, like if you allow for a lot of um, if you allow for several noisy samples in a row, you're going to have a tougher time even numerically. But again, like this is a bit an arbitrary way of constraining that. Um, the two clean samples around this spike are also kind of um, a reasonable, well, reasonable, intuitive in the, same, in the sense that you have to estimate that spike, so you better have two, two clean samples beside it. Uh, the question is whether they have to be different. We are assuming that they're different to the clean samples that are beside the, the noisy ones. That's not, I don't think that is, is actually necessary. And we, we, you also cannot have a lot of noisy samples in a certain region. We are constraining that by, by making the noisy samples have the same minimum separation. That's also arbitrary, okay? So again, I mean, this is just to show you that you can prove something about this. The conditions are not what they should be, let's say. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, I was just wondering uh, why you have this, um, uh, the, the, the condition that the kernel should be low pass. I mean, can you sort of? Uh, uh, okay, so, so the reason why is because a lot of kernels in practice are low pass. Uh, like in microscopy, when you look at problems in spectral super resolution, you want to estimate the spectrum of a signal from a finite number of samples. And um, with compressed sensing theory and theory based on incoherence, you actually cannot characterize what uh, COMEX optimization does in those cases. But those cases are very important in practice. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, do you know any way to put a constraint to have the minimum separation? During, like, you use it as a condition for your simulation? Right, right. So that's a good, exa that's a good, that's a good question. So what we're saying is, this is going to work out if the original has a minimum separation, which we're not constraining in the optimization problem. Okay, the optimization problem is blind to that. If you don't have the minimum separation, then good luck, because in some cases, it's going to be arbitrarily opposed. So no method would be able to deal with that. However, you could have something in between. You could have some signals where, imagine, two spikes are kind of close, but the rest are not so close. In those cases, often, the method is actually going to work. You would have to build a certificate for those cases. Um, and there has been some work on that. Thank you. Questions? OK, so let's thank uh, Carlos again. Thank you.